Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we'll discuss Jeremy's parents, June and Neville Bamber, who lost their lives in the tragedies at White House Farm at the hands of their schizophrenic daughter, Sheila Caffell. Over the years since 1985, the characters of June and Neville have been analysed and dissected by the remaining family. This has led not only to a complete character assassination of Jeremy's parents in books and TV programmes, but in some instances it has been inferred that they were somehow to blame for the fate which befell them. This is solely because of misconceptions, supposition and ultimately plain and simple lies created and exaggerated over the passage of time. Today we want to inform you about the real June and Neville Bamba, the hard-working, loving parents and the war heroes they truly were. Ralph Neville Bamba was born on the 9th of June 1924 in Cranley, Surrey, and was the only son of Beatrice Cecilia and Herbert Ralph Monroe Bamba. He was named after his grandfather on his mother's side, whose full name was Ralph Neville. Neville had two older sisters, Cecily Diana and Phyllis Waldry and all three siblings were known by their middle names. Neville enjoyed a privileged upbringing in the family home, the stunning and tranquil manor named Clifton House, situated in Guildford, Surrey. In later years, as adults, Diana and Audrey both moved to live in Africa. Sadly, both were killed in tragic circumstances. Audrey died in a car accident in 1950, leaving a husband and two small children, Anthony and Jacqueline Pargita. Diana worked in Kenya as a tour consultant for the British Overseas Airways Corporation, a job she loved. But in March 1968, as she was inspecting the track of the annual East African Safari Railway, she had helped to organise the driver of the vehicle in which she travelled accidentally hit a lorry and Diana was killed outright. Neville's education began at the age of 10 when he went to Christ's Hospital School in Horsham, West Sussex, and shortly after leaving school, he decided that he'd like to serve his country and applied to join the Royal Air Force. 17-year-old Neville was enlisted as a volunteer on the 8th of September 1941, and after selection as a student pilot, Neville had to progress through several stages of training and regular tests had to be taken and passed before he could be trained to fly a plane. The time it took to qualify as a pilot varied, but at the start of the Second World War, some were able to qualify after just 150 flying hours had been completed, which took approximately six months to achieve. Neville was a good student and quickly advanced and ultimately gained the rank of pilot too. Neville flew mosquitoes in North Africa during World War II as part of 13 Squadron. In November 1942, the squadron took part in Operation Torch, which involved a short period of intense day and night raids that incurred many losses. Neville also flew in 55 Squadron, which operated in the North African desert and conducted daylight bombing missions, as well as a period of anti-shipping sweeps between September 1941 and March 1942. On June 8, 1943, Neville's mosquito was involved in an air crash and he was fortunate to have survived it. He was admitted to an emergency hospital where he remained for eight weeks of hospital care before being discharged and returning to England to undergo occupational therapy treatment. By November 1944, Neville was keen to get back to active service and resumed his duties conducting countless missions until he left the RAF in September 1947. Neville was still only 23 and decided that he would like a new challenge and a change of direction in life, so he enrolled at the Royal Agricultural College in Sirencester. It was here that he met the father of his future brother-in-law, Robert Bowflower, who was a professor of agriculture at the college. The professor and his eager student got on well, and it was not long before Professor Robert Bowflower recommended to his son, also named Robert, 
but Neville would be the perfect candidate to help out on his farm during the harvest. Neville proved to be an extremely hard worker who enjoyed and excelled in the demands of work on the farm. Robert Beauflower Jr. was the tenant farmer of Carbonell's farm. The tenancy was given to him as a wedding gift for a nominal rent of £1 per year by Mabel and Leslie Speakman when he married Pamela Speakman, whose sister, June, was to eventually marry Neville Bamba. June's mother, Mabel Bunting, was born in 1890, the only daughter of John and Sarah Bunting. Mabel had three brothers and they lived in a beautiful location, Hyams Farm, situated in Goldhanger, Essex. Her future husband, Leslie Speakman, was born in 1893 and was the eldest child of Samuel and Florence Speakman. He was raised at St Clair's Hall in Danbury, Essex. In 1919, 26-year-old Leslie married Mabel and the young couple went to live at Volte Manor Farm in Essex and Leslie farmed the land there. But tragedy soon struck Mabel and Leslie's family when shortly after giving birth to her second daughter, Leslie's sister was killed in a car accident. This left her two very young daughters, Betty and Alice, orphaned and they were quickly taken under Mabel's wing and moved into Volte Manor. Betty and Alice spent the remainder of their childhood in the care of Mabel and Leslie. Although they had formally adopted their nieces, Mabel and Leslie wanted children of their own and had two girls, Pamela born in 1920 and June in 1924. The close-knit family was now complete. As they grew older, all four girls were educated at the historic Malden Grammar School. Pamela and June looked up to the elder girls and regarded Betty and Alice not as cousins, but as their older sisters. In later years, Betty went on to marry a local man, Tom Howie, who owned the farm next to Volte Manor. And Alice married a young farmer, John Ledger, and moved to live in Deal, Kent. Mabel owned some fields in Haybridge, and in 1933 decided to open these up to families who were working on the farm harvesting the fruit and peas. Access to the fields for camping soon became popular with the farm workers and developed into a friendly and peaceful place where the families could have a well-deserved rest after the long working days of manual labour on the land. Initially, the fruit pickers who were working on many of the local farms brought tents and camped, but within a short space of time, Mabel ensured that caravans were available so that there was an alternative to camping on the land. As such, the O.C. Road caravan site was born. Over several years, and with a huge amount of hard work, the site became a thriving business when Lizzie Speakman died. Mabel divided the shares in the caravan park equally between Pamela and June, and in later years still, Anne Eaton, Pam's daughter, and Jeremy Bamber were each given an 8% share from their mother's holding. After the Second World War, Pamela Speakman met Robert Woodwist Beauflower. They married on the 11th of January 1947 and six months later they were given the tenancy of both Carbonell's farm and neighbouring Burnt Ash Farm in Wicks, Essex. Pamela and Robert had two children, David born in October 1947 and Christine Anne, who preferred to be called Anne, born in September 1949. Anne later married Peter Eaton and went on to live at White House Farm after the tragedy there. As we said earlier, it was in 1948 that Robert Beauflower's father recommended to his son that Neville Bamba would be perfect to help with the harvest. Diligent, intelligent and tenacious, Neville soon made an impression on everyone, including his future wife, June, whom he met at a dance held at the Agricultural College, which she had gone to with her sister, Pamela. When she left school, June attended Secretarial College and after qualifying became a secretary for the Fire Guard headquarters in Colchester. In 1940, at just 16 years of age, June volunteered as a shorthand typist for the War Office. She listed her qualifications as first aid, home nursing, shorthand, clerical experience and knowledge of French. June was delighted when she was offered the job. In 1940, the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, was formed. This was a top-secret volunteer organisation 
who employed men with combat training and also civilians. The secret organisation used their agents to conduct a variety of operations. Winston Churchill once said that the purpose of SOE agents was to set Europe ablaze. In 1941, SOE also began to recruit women. The limited number of women who were invited to join were aged between 20 and 53. The focus was initially on women who were top of their specialist area, especially those who had language skills. Successful applicants were given positions as operatives into the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, or the Auxiliary Transport Service as a cover to disguise the secret work they were undertaking. In 1944, June was recommended for an interview to become a member of the FANYSU, the cover name for the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry Special Unit, working with the Special Operations Executive. Following the selection, June was sent for specialist training. The induction process and preparations were rigorous, thorough and fast, and in 1945, now aged 21, June underwent her instruction in Oxfordshire where she specialised in wireless telegraphy and coding and would ultimately send and receive messages to and from the SOE agents working behind the Japanese lines. June was soon able to apply her secretarial skills to this role and was noted as being able to type in an extremely fast and accurate manner. Once the training was complete, June was sent to RAF Ringway in Cheshire where she was trained as a parachutist. This was to enable the selected women to be able to enter designated conflict areas either by parachute or fishing boat. It was an immensely dangerous job, but one where, particularly in France, female agents could blend in with the locals. The enemy did not perceive the women as combatants, nor were the Nazis rounding up women for forced labour like they were the men. Women could travel on trains and trams or ride bicycles with explosives hidden under their groceries without arousing suspicion. Over her military career, June embarked on missions in India, Ceylon and the Far East where she transmitted vital messages to and from fellow agents behind enemy lines. By December 1945, June had arrived home at Vaulty Manor after being demobbed. Modestly, June did not speak to family members about her crucial work during World War II and no one in the family knew what an important role she played. In recent years, the campaign team managed to obtain the war records of June and Neville and it's from these documents that the facts have become known. June and Neville shared a lot of common ground. Both came from wealthy families, both had interests in farming and they had both served their country during the Second World War. Neville was already aware of June through his work for Robert Bowflower, and when they were formally introduced at a dance, they instantly got on. Neville impressed June with his hair-raising tales of adventure during the war, and Neville found June to be a beautiful young lady who was extremely intelligent, altruistic and lively. June was also an excellent conversationalist, which attracted Neville greatly. They married on the 3rd of September 1949 at St Andrew's Church in Goldhanger. Their first home was a cottage in Wash Lane, about a quarter of a mile from Vaulty Manor. Within two years, Neville was offered his own farm to work on. However, this was not within the sprawling Essex countryside, but thousands of miles away in Rhodesia, modern-day Zimbabwe. Leslie Speakman, June's father, didn't want to lose his daughter or the hard-working Neville and was reluctant for Neville to accept the offer and emigrate. And so, when the tenancy of White House Farm became available, Leslie recommended that Neville should take it. He also raised with Neville the possibility of forming a business partnership with him with their own farming company. Neville accepted, and it wasn't long before he and June moved into White House Farm. As promised, Leslie Speakman set up the company Speakman & Bamba, and following Leslie's death in 1975, the name was changed to become N&J Bamba Limited. As well as being a diligent and effective farmer, Neville was also a magistrate serving on the Witham bench. During harvest time, Neville was excused from his duties on the bench 
but for the remainder of the year, he attended one hearing per week at Witham Magistrates Court. Neville loved being a magistrate, and he felt that it was his civic duty. He was often upset by evidence that showed that crime and poverty were so clearly linked, although he felt the legal rules in place hampered his ability to help some of the people who stood before him on trial. June was a very keen gardener and enjoyed arranging the flowers in the local church and organising coffee mornings for the local community. June was a very active member of St Nicholas Church congregation and was appointed a church warden along with Neville in later life. June also loved to bake and spent many hours happily baking in the kitchen of the farm creating her favourite cakes and buns. Unable to have children of their own, Neville and June decided to adopt. They approached the Church of England Children's Society and were overjoyed when they adopted Sheila in 1957 and then Jeremy in 1961. Jeremy and Sheila grew up knowing they were adopted and June kept a box of letters and information for each of them containing details of their natural parents and the circumstances of their birth. Both June and Neville were loving and caring parents to their children. June shared her love of nature and wildlife with Sheila and Jeremy, teaching them the names of all the wildlife in the hedgerows around them and the names of every species of flower and butterfly, as well as bird calls and songs. June and Neville also supported Sheila and Jeremy in every way possible. They ensured that they had the best education money could buy so that their futures would be happy and productive. They kept them grounded and taught them to use their privileged lifestyle to help others. They treated both children in the same way and never left one of them out. When it was Sheila's birthday, Jeremy was also given birthday gifts and the other way around when it was Jeremy's birthday. And for example, when they were older and June bought Sheila and her husband Colin a flat in Hampstead as a wedding gift, Neville bought Jeremy his cottage in a gold hanger. When Neville's mother Beatrice became ill, she moved into White House Farm and was cared for by June and the entire family for a number of years until she passed away. After Sheila had the twins, June was aware that Sheila was struggling, especially so after her divorce, and she was caring for them alone. June made sure that she visited Sheila as often as possible to give her help. In the early years of Sheila's marriage to Colin Caffell, money was tight for the young couple and Colin was in and out of work and so June helped him to find a job as a sales representative which paid a decent wage. June also paid for Colin to have driving lessons and bought him a car so that he could take Sheila and the twins to White House Farm as often as they wanted. June offered to buy him the old post office in the village which had outbuildings attached. June thought this would be a great solution as Sheila and Nicholas and Daniel could be close to the family and Colin could use the buildings as a studio to sell his artwork in the shop. However, Colin declined the offer. Sadly, June's mental health deteriorated during the 70s and by 1982 it was necessary for her to spend some time in St Andrew's Hospital, Northampton, where she received electroconvulsive therapy twice during her stay. This treatment affected June negatively and whilst it appeared to help with her depression, it also affected her personality and she then seemed less able to cope with her life as a housewife. It was now that June became much more focused on religion, which she found to be a great source of comfort, especially so after her treatment at St Andrews. It helped her to cope and provided her with hope, especially with her mental health issues. June was a great philosopher and the Bible provided inspiration and gave her food for thought on life issues. After the tragedies on the 7th of August 1985, Senior Investigation Officer DSI Ainsley wrote in his report to the DPP about June's religious beliefs and her previous health issues. In composing his report, Ainsley misled the DPP by suggesting that June was currently ill and suffering from psychosis at the time of the tragedies. June's psychiatrist, Dr Ferguson, had already described in a witness statement 
that although June had suffered from psychosis in 1959 and 1982, she was currently well and had been since 1982. But Ainsley failed to give this information to the DPP for reasons only he knows. DSI Ainsley wrote of June that she was unable to bear children and it is this that is believed to have caused her to become something of a religious fanatic. This in turn may have some bearing on the events which unfolded and culminated in the tragedy of the 7th of August 1985. Dr Ferguson, consultant psychiatrist, describes June as suffering from a psychosis which distorted her strong religious beliefs, seeing everything in terms of good or evil. So this effectively put part of the blame on June for the tragedies. June's attitudes to religion has been an area many have debated in the years since the tragedies. Poorly researched articles by journalists, authors and TV filmmakers have stated that June was obsessive about religion, forcing her beliefs onto her children and grandchildren and forcing Nicholas and Daniel to pray. When they were children, Sheila and Jeremy only went to church occasionally and it was not forced upon either of them to do so. June was interested in the philosophy of religion and the arguments it raised and what that actually meant in life and how that could help her in aiding others as she had done all her life. It was only after her breakdown and time in hospital in 1982 that religion became more of a daily necessity for June. At this time, a new vicar at the local church, Reverend Thorpe, played a part in June's life in encouraging and exacerbating June's interests and beliefs. But even at this time, when religion became so much more dominant in her life, June never pushed her beliefs onto anyone. Colin Caffell set out in a letter which he had intended to send to Neville Bamber, but never posted. The June had forced the twins to say prayers at every opportunity she had alone with them. And there's no evidence to support this proposition. Evangelism and the preaching of the American minister, Billy Graham, seemed also to have had an impact on June. She was attracted to his teachings and his reasonings and began to find even more fulfilment from the passages and messages of the scriptures. In fact, in June 1984, June and Sheila went on a coach trip with fellow Christians from St Nicholas Church to a Billy Graham convention at Ipswich to listen to him in person. Although June believed in God and the lessons of the Bible, she sought the truth of things, not just belief through faith. It was the deep study of the text and the philosophy of the Bible that became central to June and her study and analysis of the scriptures, which gave her a renewed sense of purpose. It also drove her to find the answers she needed by asking questions of others in the hope that they could give her the truth that she was seeking. June and Neville were devoted, hard-working and loving parents who Jeremy loved with all his heart and still loves to this day. They were the pillars of the community with distinguished war records who tried to help so many people with their love, wisdom and their natural inclination to support others. They were recognised by the church which they devoted many hours to helping with a lantern and a plaque of remembrance on the wall of the village church they loved so dearly. Mm-hmm.